Everybody and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. I got a special guest for you today, Thomas Freeme from the podcast. He's done a lot of time in federal prison, been in some very dangerous places. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but before we do that, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I promise you we're going to bring it to you real, bring it to you raw, and we have a mission to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death through our stories. So, Thomas, tell the people who you are, where you're from, man, and how you ended up in prison. So, I'm out here in Florida, down here in the dirty bottom. Um, I caught a, a dope charge. I was in a conspiracy, five kilos or more. Uh, it's what you call ghost dope. There was no drugs. There was no nothing. It was just, just a bunch of us kids growing up in a neighborhood, man, that were just getting money, man. And they threw us on a big conspiracy. Everybody started ratting on one another. I ended up going to trial. Um, <clears throat> long story short, they gave me 210 months. I ended up at Mariana, Mariana FCI. Okay, so you're, you, your first prison's Mariana, right? Right. Where's that? Is that in Florida? Right, that's up there around the Tallahassee, up in the Panhandle, right before you get into Georgia. You see some violence over there? You know, Mariana was a real laid back spot. I got there in 2005, you know, and, and it was real laid back. It was, it was real mellow. You know, everybody knew everybody, everybody got along. You know, if, if you saw a fight or, or any kind of violence, it's because you knew that somebody did something to deserve it. You know what I mean? Um, it was just a real laid back environment. We were out playing softball every day. Then they started bringing the, the pedophiles onto the compound. And, and everything flipped then, you know. As um, soon as the, as soon as, you know, we all got together, as soon as the ped pedophiles hit the, hit the, you know, hit the yard, we just attacked them and got them off the yard. So then that's when they started coming with, you know, the warden came out with a memo that if you touch one of these people, now you're subject to five years. So uh, that kind of nipped it, it kind of didn't. So what they ended up doing was coming, because now I make it to a low. I'm not a violent person. You know, this was my first, it was a nonviolent first time drug offense. You know, I guess 17 and a half years for this. And, uh, and I, I was a low status. So they came and they said, you know, if you want to get off the compound because you have an issue with the people that are here, they were starting that program. So they're like, we'll move you to whatever low that you want to go. They were shipping people wherever they wanted to go. Well, me and a whole, you know, bunch of our homeboys, we were trying to get down to Miami Low. Well, I end up in Texas, right? So when that comes up, now I'm fuming because I got a three-month-old baby daughter at the time, you know, or three-year-old, not three months, three-year-old baby daughter at the time. My family, they're ready. I know they can't get out to Texas, right? So now I'm pissed off and I'm trying to get out of this transfer now. So they're saying there's nothing that can be done. I have to go out to Texarkana, do, they tell me this, what they tell me, just do 90 days out there, good time, then you can put in for a transfer to come back. This is what I'm told. So I'm now catching news because I'm asking dudes, you know, well, what's this spot like? Because this is when you get ready for a transfer, this is what you're asking people so you know how to prepare for your next spot. Dude, you know, you're letting dudes know this is where I'm going. They want to shoot kites with you, things of that nature. So... There was a dude named Donuts, man. Donuts, if you're seeing this, man, get a hold of me, piece of shit, you. So Donuts, they call Bag of Donuts, right? He's telling me now, I'm going to have issues when I go out west. He says, it's a different breed out there. It's nothing like where I'm at. You know, it's, it's different. And I'm going to have issues because I'm from Florida. And what he meant by that is I get along with everybody. You know, I, I, I converse with everybody. I'll sell with anybody. You know, things of that nature. When you get out past... The Mississippi and go west, all of that stops. You're getting into segregation, you're getting into racism. You know, this is a world that I've never really been in. So I get out to Texarkana. Long story short, right? I don't like it. I hate it. I'm meeting these dudes, these ABTs, and these this is a low. 
30 white boys, ABTs, these dudes are all coming to me. Hey, man, you know, you need to click up with us, this and that. And I'm just telling them, like, man, listen, first off, I'm, I'm not into gangs. I don't belong in gangs. I don't disrespect them. Y'all do your thing. It's just not for me, you know. And furthermore, this is a low. Let me ask you, to... let me stop you for a minute. Let me ask you this, uh -huh. because the, some of the viewers might not know, what is an ABT? What is a TAB? What is a dirty white boy, DWB? Explain that. Tell, tell me what the ABTs are. So ABT is, is a branch. It's, it's a branch that broke off, from my understanding, what was explained to me, is a branch that broke off from the Aryan Brotherhood, the original group that, that grew out of California. The ABTs broke out and created their own Aryan Brotherhood group, which is Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. Now, TAB is a branch from the California divide, which is Texas Aryan Brotherhood. So that's the difference between the two. ABT is its own organization, right? Founded in, in, in strictly from Texas. So uh, Dirty White Boys is DWB. And, and I don't know too much about Dirty White Boys. <clears throat> um, again, I've met a few good dudes. There was one dude that I met at Texarkana named Chris Isaac, I believe. I believe he came from I want to say he came from Pollock, and he supposedly claims that he's the founder of the Dirty White Boys. And when him and I were talking, and he's sitting there telling me, Chris Isaac was his name, and he's telling me that he didn't want any part of it no more because he didn't like the direction that it was going in, you know, and, and he wanted to, to part ways from it with that. But so long story short, I'm stuck out here in, in Texarkana now. I hate the place. Right, it's 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 crazy. It's just a bunch of knuckleheads, again trying to be gang bangers in a low. That's how I looked at it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I ended up jacking my time off there, right? I I created a big scuffle in the chow hall over the hamburgers because I did. I was just frustrated and I didn't get my my fair share of fries. So when I went to go ask the lady about the fries, like, listen, first off, these these fries are baked. You know, and there's only like four flat fries on my tray. So she tells me just to sit down and shut up and enjoy my food. Right. So at that time, I asked her, I said, well, how, you know, what did you just say? So this detective or not detective, but the, the CO right in the child hall comes over, grabs my wrist. Now, I swing my wrist because now I don't know who it is. He grabs me from kind of from behind to try to swing me away from the, the child hall lady. So. You know, in the process of snatching my wrist back, he kind of went with me and went over my hip. You know, and this is, this is hamburger day, right? Wednesday, child hall's packed, right? So now they all come rush me, you know, and I just kind of step back and I'm like, listen, don't rough me up, man. Whatever you do, don't rough me up. So they're like, no, you're just going to go to the shoes. So now they ship me from there to Three Rivers. Again, I don't have no issues now. When I get to Three Rivers, I'm meeting... Three Rivers is a medium now, right? And this is in West Texas. Again, I have no issues, no issues with no gangs. I'm, I'm cool with everybody, man. There's a dude named Drew that was an AB out of Oklahoma, cool ass dude, man. I, I'm, I'm rapping with everybody. This is the type of dude I am, you know? I'm legit, I stand on my own. I don't bother nobody, I'm a convict. I wanna talk about the violence you've seen, man, when you got there. Because a lot of the viewers want to know what's going on in prison, man. What type of violence was there in Three Rivers? So Three Rivers, again, right, it, it was all politics, but it was it was well-maintained politics, right? It wasn't until I got to Beaumont, bloody Beaumont, right? Now, when, as soon as I get to Beaumont, my first experience of walking into Beaumont is I got these five dudes, right? These five dudes that are twice the size of me, masked skulls, tattoos, ABT across their neck. They meet me at the door, right? I come in with my, my package through the door and they're like, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from Florida. So they asked me, they said, well, are you on Florida time or are you on Pepperwood time? So I asked them, I said, well, man, I'm just on my time, right? So they say, okay, so you're independent. So I tell them, yeah, I'm independent. You know, so they get me over to the independence. Now, after about two weeks on the compound, I'm celled with the captain of the ABTs, right? 
So that's the shot caller. The captain's the shot caller on that yard. Not a, he's not the shot caller on the yard because the 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 one of the founders was actually in there in the unit with us. Okay. Right, he's in for life. So, but he's a high ranking official, and he just came out of state. So in state in Texas state, if you're gang membered or affiliated, you do your whole time in SEG. So this dude did 10 years in SEG and then gets let loose on a, on a violent yard, right? So I have a biracial daughter and I try to keep that a secret when I was on the compound, right? But one day I'm in there looking at my mail and I'm looking at my pictures and he sees my daughter over my, my shoulder, right? He don't say anything other than, oh man, don't sweat it out. I don't give a fuck about that shit. Now, that night I go to sleep. The next morning I get up, right? I wake up, I'm brushing my teeth. He's not in the room, he's gone. So I brush my teeth, I go to the chow hall. I see him, you know, they're at their AB table. So I see him sitting at the table and he's looking at me with this other dude sitting next to him. You know, another, I think he wanted to be in the gang. So he's like the, the little whatever dude. So I know something's wrong the way that they're looking at me. I go back to my cell, right? By the time I get back to my cell, three of them come in the room, right? And he's in front of them. They, they come in, they got the door blocked. I'm, I don't have no, I didn't even have time to even get anything. So the dude comes up to me and he's like, man, listen, man. He said, you're getting your bitch ass out of my cell today. You know, he said, you was in here jacking off on me last night. So I tell him, I say, Moon, I say, listen, man, I say, uh, don't, don't come at me like that, man. I say, you know, whatever, if you got problems with me, but don't, don't spread that about me. I said, because that's not me. Don't put that out there on me, you know? So he's got this machete, right? He's standing there now with this machete. He's got these three dudes blocking the door, right? I'm scared to death. I've never been put in this position in my life. Right, I'm scared to death. He's telling me that he should start stabbing me in this room right here. I think the thing that saved me is I asked him, I said, let me ask you something. I said, if you was in here last night and you knew that I was doing that to you, why didn't you confront me then? Why didn't you step to me then in the cell when it was just me and you, when I was doing this and we could have squared it you know, away then? Why did you just let me finish off and you went to sleep? What kind of shit is that? So when I said that, the other dudes looked at him with question, like, you know, so these are the positions that I was put in at this place, right? What ended up happening was what, what the whole thing was, was that because I was an independent and they didn't like me after seeing that I was, I had a biracial daughter, they had to get me off the yard. So they had to come up with something big enough for them to run me off the yard. So, but let me stop you for a second. We're, we're going to get to that, right? Let me ask you this, because there are dudes in federal prison and in, in state prisons, they're gunners, right? Guys that jack off on the women. You know, they think that it's cool. Their car don't smash them for it. So he just, he just kind of puts that together, you're saying, and, and, and makes that up because you've got a biracial daughter. He don't want you in the cell because he wants to act tough around his homeboys. So he, you know, pretty much he alleges that you're a gunner and you're gunning in there while he's sleeping jacking off, masturbating, whatever. Well, there was a, the, the whole story behind that. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a whole story behind it as well, is that they, <clears throat> they wanted me to join their organization. They wanted me to do things. They wanted me to carry things. Hold on. Them. Organization or a gang? They're a gang. Okay. They're a gang. I want the viewers to know that. Right. So they, they were trying to get me, listen, man, this is what you got to do. We run the compound. You don't have to be a part of the gang, but while you're here, these are the things that you have to do. And I'm like, man, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it, man. You know, I'm not doing it. I'm nobody's do boy. I'm not doing it. So this was the friction. Plus, other than the fact that I was walking the yard with black dudes, I would walk the track with black dudes. I would cook in the unit with black dudes. These is the things that was, that was grinding their gears. They would come to me and they would say, listen, we don't want you walking the track with black dudes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would adhere to that. I would tell him, listen, OK, I'm not here to disrespect nobody. So I was doing everything that I could do to try to show them respect on their compound. And then when this occurred, they got the green light. Right. So now I just get out of the shower. I come in. You know, I got the towel around my back. Next thing I knew, I hit my, my door open and he cracks me. You got shower shoes on? Or you got your sneakers on? 
Because I don't know what the politics are over there. No, well, so I'm, I'm barefoot at this time because the way that it is, I'm in a tank now. I'm in a six-man tank. So my locker is kind of adjacent to the door. So he, he caught me perfect because I just got out of the shower with my shoes, right? Because, yes, you take a shower, you have your shoes, your boots right there by the shower. You take a shower, you reach out, you put your boots on, you got somebody by the shower watching such and such, you know? So I go in, this is how I knew that the independence set me up, right? Because the dude that was watching the shower, supposed to, he wasn't watching the shower, but I'm thinking he was, right? But these are all Texas dudes. I'm way out of my place. I'm from Florida. So he comes in, he cracks me. Dude cracks me, dazes me. I fall back. I put my hands up, you know, and, and he's, he's hitting me, you know, but I don't know how he's hitting me because I'm dazed from the blow. But I, I'm, I, know, I, I know that he's not hurting me, and I take him by his hips, and I spin him. I grab him, I go up with him, and I go back. When I do that, they all come in and rush me. You know, I should have really just let the dude tag me up a couple times or whatever. I didn't know what was going on. I wouldn't be doing that. I wouldn't be letting no one tag me up. But You, you, you don't know, you know, because you're in, a, you're in an element where, again, in my mind, I'm like by myself, right? I don't know what's going on. This is the first time, Chad, I'm going to be honest with you, that I've ever pissed myself. I didn't even realize it till afterwards, but you know that when you, when your body feels like it's in a deadly situation, it releases everything. But when you're, when you're in a situation like that, right, because I've been in some bad situations in prison, man, but when I'm in a situation like that, I feel like I'm fighting for my life. Did you feel like you were fighting for your life at that moment? Well, this is, this is what I'm saying is because I, I've seen firsthand what these dudes have done, right? They don't, they don't, they, they hurt people. They stab people for no reason. They make things up about people, right? Just to create drama, just to create, because there's nothing else to do, right? So again, I became that mark, you know? So all of this is flashing in my head. Like I'm here alone, I'm by myself. These dudes are rushing me. Right, so now I'm fighting this dude, and the next thing I know is I wake up. The cop, the CO is waking me up. I'm up under the bunk. So when he pulls me out from under the bunk, right, I don't know what happened. All I remember is going back with the dude, right, and then seeing everybody come at me, you know. So the first thing I do, I step up, you know, and I'm feeling myself, like, you know, and the cop is asking me, you know, are you stabbed? And I'm like, man, I don't think so, you know. So then they took me to the shoe then and put me on protective custody, which I didn't know till three weeks later, right? Mm -hmm. Once I found that out, this is when I told them, no, man, I'm, I'm not checking in, I'm back. So like, well, we can't let you out on the compound. So I'm telling them I'm not checking in. Did they stab you or no? They just were punching you? They, 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 they split my eye, cracked my jaw. They, they knocked me unconscious. Come to find out, Right, come to find out to sum all of this up, the black dudes is the ones that have my back. There was a couple gang members that had my back, and they said that if anything was that, because they knew what was going on, they knew why they were pressing me, all because of the issue with my daughter, because that's what was talked about and heard through whispers on the compound. So I had dudes that Crips out of Houston. I want to give these dudes shouts out, you know, GDs out of out of Detroit. You know, Tack, Capone, these dudes, they put word out like, no, nah, it's not going to happen to him. You know, he's a good dude because reputation followed me, you know, mm -hmm. reputation followed me. But that place was bad, man. Bloody Beaumont. I was there for the riot. I was there with the with the with the uh, the MS-13 where they would sit out on the yard and they would try to coax the, the Pisces. They wait for the bus to come in. And they would be telling the Pisces, yeah, yeah, we Pisces, Pisces, it's okay, you can come, you can come. Trying to coax them on so they could kill these people. So the MS-13 was at Beaumont, bloody Beaumont. They wanted the Pisces to come on the yard. Those are mostly Mexican prisoners that are from Mexico, right? Those are, that's what the Pisces are. The, the Pisces, the Pisces are kind of like how we, how we view us as independents. It's kind of how Pisces are. But they're, but they're mostly from their country, Mexicans that Mexico, are right. from Mexico. That didn't grow up in California or Indiana. Straight LA, from Mexico. Straight from Mexico. And the MS-13, they want to get these guys. That's what you're saying? 
Yes. So they're trying to trick them to come on the yard? So they would trick them to come on the yard because as the bus comes in, you can stand out on the yard. This is how we know who checks in and who don't. Because you can stand out in the yard and say, okay, four white guys got off, 10 Mexicans got off, three blacks got off. If they don't come out on the yard, now you're finding out why they didn't and who they are. Okay. So, bloody Beaumont, full of violence, people trying to kill people. They jump on you. You go to the hole. What happens when you're in the hole? Do you come out? Do you get transferred? Are the black dudes looking out for you to let you come back on the compound? Tell the people what happened. So, what ended up happening was, you know, when I told the captain, I found out that they had me under there under PC, and I told them that that ain't happening. I'm not doing that. I'm not checking in, you know. So, I ended up having to sign a, a bad man waiver is what we call it. Right, which what that is is an affidavit stating that whatever is that happened to me on the compound, the federal government is not responsible for no more because they tried to protect me because these gangs were telling them that I'm not coming out in the compound, you know. Mm -hmm. So the day I got out in the compound, there was a dude that stepped to me from Allenwood, just came from Allenwood. And, and the, while I was in there, they flipped a little bit of the yard and they were bringing dudes from the pen from the East Coast. So a couple of these dudes came over there, they heard about me, they heard about the incident, and they're like, don't worry about it, we've already straightened it out, you ain't got nothing to worry about. And and I just did the rest of my time, you know what I mean, pretty much in peace. Again, you know, I, I did what I had to do, you know, just to get out of there in one piece, but it's a place that you could definitely, definitely get fucked up in. Either come out with a colostomy bag, or not come out at all. So you ended up coming out of the shoe. You went back to the compound in Beaumont? Yeah. And who'd you, I mean, who did you run with after you came out of the hole? Same thing. So they put me into a unit. They put me over in, um, they put me over in KB. And uh, this dude from Allenwood, from the pen, him and I. And uh, he was an older guy. And, um, and that was it, man. From that point on, um, because KB didn't have any, have any Aryan Brotherhood in there. Yeah. Excuse me. The Aryan Brotherhood was in because they all kind of try to stick together. They were in the other units, you know. But I would see these dudes on the compound. You know what I mean? When you seen these dudes on the compound, did you ever want to lash out? You ever want to get there's some no, get back? There's, there's no question. There's no question. And there was a day. See, the whole time, Chad. What you have to understand is, I'm just trying to come. Home. I'm trying to get back to Florida. I don't want no problems. I'm not trying to be tough. I'm just trying to. I have a daughter. My family's elderly. They took me away. I'm just trying to get back to Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So all of this is occurring to me, and I'm just trying to mind my own fucking business and get back to Florida. So there was a dude, so the, another dude stepped to me out on the on the, the wreck yard, right? I'm walking the track. This dude comes up to me, and he's telling me, come on, let's go to the bathroom. So I'm telling him, listen, man, you know, first off, I've already seen your fight game, and it's nothing to, nothing to, to, to brag about, right? I don't want no problems, you know, leave me the fuck alone. So I walk the track again. When I come around again, he comes down, he takes a swing at me on the yard. Now, this is a white dude? Yard. It's a white dude. Yeah. All of these are white dudes. Only problems I ever had was with white dudes out here in Texas, man, these ABTs. So this dude was, was one of these ones that wanted to impress the ABTs because he wanted to get in the little clique, right? Mm -hmm. So he wanted to impress them. So he thought by impressing them, he could come try to latch on to me. So now, I'm, again, he's calling me bitch, he's calling me this, I don't mind. But now when he took a swing at me on the yard, right, now, again, this is on the yard. So now I say, okay, you know what, let's go to the bathroom. So we go to the bathroom, and I tear his ass up in the bathroom. Tear his ass up right there by the, 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 the trench fucking urinal. And like you say, I took all of that anger out of what them dudes did to me. And I made sure that they saw what I'm, what I'm capable of doing when it's just one-on-one, -on -one, right? When it's just me and you, where I can defend myself against you, this is what I can do. And he wore that for that. So, now that you've been through all this stuff in federal prison, you know, obviously you've seen the ABTs, they stab people, they've done things, bad things to people. You've been in a bad situation. Do you think that changed who you were as a person where you learned to, I want to say, appreciate your freedom a little more, where you're like, Man, I don't never want to go back to prison. I don't never want to be in that position. 
And I ask you that because I say that from my own point of view. I mean, I've been in some situations where I fought, I've done some things that I'm not proud of where, you know, I had to put my hands on people and, you know, I was involved in some, you know, some major violence in USP Big Sandy. But I, there came a point in my life where I said, I don't want to live like that no more. And I don't want to be in that position where it's kill or be killed. So that's what made me appreciate my freedom more than anything. We can talk about the programs that I've done, the rehabilitation, but really at the end of the day, I never want to be back in that position again, bro. And that's what made me appreciate my freedom more than anything in the world is that the violence that I seen, the violence that I experienced, and the violence that I was involved in because I didn't want to live that life, man. Do you feel that way? You know, Chad, what, what changed me, brother, is is looking around at these people and knowing that I didn't belong there. I, I didn't, this wasn't my crowd. I was better than this, you know. It, it What changed me wasn't the, the, the element or the fear or, or the violence of what was going on in prison. What changed me was I just didn't want to be that anymore. And, and realizing as I got older and having my own child, the damage that I'd done being, you know, who I was out in the street, delivering poison to the communities, breaking families up. I didn't want to be part of that life anymore. I didn't want to be a criminal. I didn't want to, I didn't want society to look at me as a piece of shit. At the end of the day, Chad, I asked myself, what, what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want people, when I'm gone, what do I want people to say about me? Do I want them to say he was just another dumb drug dealing guy that wasted his life on prison? Or do I want them to say that he's a good father, he's a good man, he did good for his community and he tried to help humanity grow and flourish. And I just want to be beat, you know? And, and that's what changed me, you know? I respect that, man. For 100%, I respect that. I, I mean, that's how I feel, man. I want to live my life. I want to be free. I don't, I don't want people to say, "Hey, that dude was, you know, just somebody." I want them to, say, I want them to, be like, "Hey, that dude did some good things in his life." You know, did some good things. You know, sometimes we make irrational, irresponsible choices that lead us down that road, right? But you know, like I know, all roads in life, for good or evil, begin with one small step. When we choose the path, we choose our destination. But we have the ability to change that, man. And I want people to know that, to see that that you can change that path. And when you change that path, you can change your destination. How long have you been free? Man, I've been free. Ah, let's say, I wanna say, I'm gonna go deep on you, man. I'm gonna throw you for a curve. I'm gonna say I've been free okay. for about eight years now. I've been out of prison for four, but I've been free for eight. That's deep, man. So since you've been out of prison, what have you been doing with your life since you've been out of prison? So, you know, it was a struggle. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with, with, with PTSD. I'm dealing with high anxiety. I'm trying to, to form a relationship and be a productive citizen with these conditions that I experienced that Beaumont changed me under, under that lifestyle that I was in, right? Um, so it's, it's getting along with people in society and, and learning how to adapt. It took me about two or three years to really understand that this is what was occurring to me, understanding why I was getting angry, understanding why I was lashing out. Once I understood that, I knew how to attack the problem. From that point on, my life has changed, man. It's, it's been golden. I'm, you know, I started a foundation. It's called www.cominghomecoalition.com. What that does is, is it the goal of this organization is to help individuals that are coming home before they come home. I have connections with businesses. I want to connect these businesses to a program inside of every prison to teach these guys that may have, uh, they may want to get into banking. They may want to get into whatever it is that they want to get into. I want to connect these people to the businesses so that these businesses can train them in a program before they come home. They will already have employment coming home, so they won't have that pressure of having to look for a job up under this PO. They'll know that they can come home, they can unwind, they can relax a little bit, they have their job, it's set in stone, they're trained for it, and they can provide a, a, a productive career. 
you know. I have my podcast, you know, my podcast deals with mental health. It deals with what you and I talk about, but more along the lines as the choices and the decisions. Helping them individuals understand why they keep going back to prison. Helping them understand why they even went to prison, right? Mm -hmm. And stop blaming other people and understanding that, like you said, we make the choice at the end of the day, right? That's it. You and I, when we were doing the things that we were doing, <clears throat> we weren't living our lives by our choices. And that's what we have to understand is we grew up under our parents, whatever our environment was without really us understanding who we were as a human being that happens in prison you know when you have time to sit back and reflect on your life prison is a luxury that most people don't have this is why i say i've been free eight years this is what's important about my message because prison is a mental thing right we look at prison as bad. We look at prison as, as all of these things because that is what the stigma wants us to look at, right? But at the end of the day, it's a choice in how we look at it. People pay millions of dollars to go to a monastery to separate themselves from the pressures of life. Prison is no different. We have been separated from the responsibilities and pressures of life to focus mostly on ourselves and fix ourselves. Now, we can go in there and play dominoes all day, or we can politic, or we can do all of these things, or we can use that time to, to make ourselves the best that we can be. It took me about five years to understand that, and that's when I became free, brother. I respect it. So like I said, man, the mission of this show is, right, to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death through our stories, through our experiences. If you could talk to your younger self, or if you could take a... 14-year-old kid that's in the streets doing the wrong thing, making the wrong decisions, decisions that can lead them down that road to either end up in prison or die or be killed in the streets. What would you tell that person, man? Man, I love you, man. That was a great question. You know what I would, <clears throat> you know what I would tell that person? I would tell that person, you don't need anybody else's love, right? You are all the love that you need. All the love that I needed as a kid came from me. I didn't realize that till I got into prison and started realizing the things that I was able to do and build that confidence that I could achieve by myself. I didn't need outside resources. I would go back to that kid and say, listen, man, stop chasing friends. Stop looking for people to accept you. Stop looking for people to love you. Love yourself. And then all of the rest will come. Steve, that would have changed my life. That's deep, man. I appreciate that, man. I mean, that's that's a good message. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people, but that was a hell of a message, man. Love yourself. Make yourself number one. That don't mean do the wrong thing. It means love yourself and the rest will come. That's that's exactly it, Chad. Is is this is what ego is. This is why God gave us selfishness and ego for us to put ourselves first over everything, but not to use that abundantly, right? To use it sparingly in order for it to be, which is good, right? You have to love yourself. How can I tell somebody that I love them if I don't even love myself? If I look at myself and tell myself I'm ugly, how can I tell that somebody else is beautiful if I don't even know it within me? Just everything comes from within, brother. I respect it. Hey, I'm going to give you a moment, man, to uh, say what you want to say, tell people about your podcast, how they can find you. I'm going to tell them to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and let them know. Yes, that's how we support ourselves. Guys like us, man, I don't get a dime off this. I put 60, 70, 80 hours into my business and don't make a penny from it, right? All of this, my podcast, my I don't make a penny. I do this because people are suffering and they need to come home, right? So I'm going to say this. You can visit me, Free Me Podcast. I'm on every platform. You can go cominghomecoalition.com. You can on um, YouTube. The message is there, right? What I want to say is this. Love yourself. You are beautiful. You're perfect. Don't ever tell yourself that you're not perfect. Don't ever tell yourself you're not beautiful. You are perfect, right? And what makes you perfect, you, Chad, is that you are the only person on the face of this planet named Chad Marks. There is no other person named Chad Marks. You can set your mark 
like no other person can. Nobody walks like you, talks like you, thinks like you. That's what makes you perfect. You are one of a kind, right? And that's how we have to look at ourselves. We are in the age of Aquarius. We moved into a whole new age. The age of Aquarius is about awakening. It's about honesty. It's about truthfulness, right? It's time that we start finding out who we are as a person, start appreciating who we are, and just being our best self, no matter what anybody has to say. You know, so as I like to say, just keep it pushing, Pimpin'. I appreciate you, man. Keeping it real, keeping it raw. Blood on the razor wire. Hit that subscribe button. We're out of here.